We are taking notes. And also, I would like you to take notice of the bottom line here. Although, I'm sorry, it's not our moral life in Christ. I don't think it's the sacraments book. I'll have to change that. But some of what I'm saying now does line up with the textbook, which I fully understand you do not have a copy of, but you should also understand you have you know, the, the availability to have one. So if you want one, you come to me and I give you one. It's that simple, okay? So um, if you need extra help, all right? I mean, I didn't want you to think because I just hand out textbooks that I'm not teaching things that aren't course content, all right? I just approach it a different way. So today we'll look at prayer as a gift, liturgy as a source of life, and then the church as a servant, all right? Um, and as usual, I'm really trying to answer the questions for you that I had, supposing that some of you would have something similar. So first of all, let's just look at uh, prayer as a gift. You'll also notice up here, CCC is the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Those are paragraph numbers, not page numbers. There's a link in under, I think, course documents to a website that has the entire catechism by paragraph number. So if you need more information, you could always go there and uh, avail yourself of that. First off, let's just talk about what prayer is. We've already used this definition. Let's just expand it a little bit, okay? The last part after the comma is not technically part of the definition. So we're talking about lifting our mind and our hearts to God. Okay, so let me just tell you what my difficulty was growing up. When I hear and was told by nuns, by youth ministers, by priests, that I should pray without ceasing, I had no idea what that meant. I mean, I know they couldn't have meant that you just sit there and kneel all day and pray. So, but outside of that, I had no idea. I remember once asking, I think it was a youth minister, okay, the, the, the high school I went to was a really good football team, so I'm playing football. How do I pray while I'm playing football? What is it that I do? And no real answer came about. So I'm a visual person. This may sound corny to you, but I'm trying to work it out intellectually in my head. I mean, if I have an interception, do I, like, mentally think that's for you, God? I mean, I didn't know how to process this, right? So not today, but the next time that we address this, I'll explain to you what I wish somebody would have did for me, very clearly what that means, and how you can literally be praying as you're sitting here now. You could be praying when you're in liturgy, you could be praying when you're eating lunch, you could be praying when you're sitting with your parents. Um, why do we have to, I don't know if I'm like asking this, but why do we have to like pray to Okay, well, I'll give you a real quick answer to that. Uh, so, you know, the scripture tells us that God hears the prayers of a righteous man. You know, speaking of mankind, not men. So, we always ask each other to pray. It's why we intercede, right? Hey, you know, my mom's sick, would you pray for me? Hey, I have a test coming up, pray. Somebody might say to you, well, why are you asking anybody to pray? Why don't you just tell God? Well, it's the understanding that we're in community, okay? Now, the church is not just the people that are alive. So, the last slide you did was the church militant, the church suffering, and the church triumphant. Well, we're going to just, you know, go out on a limb here and say the church triumphant are righteous people. They're in God's, you know, with God's presence. So why would we not ask them to pray for us? So when I was questioned, why do you pray to dead people? Well, you know, okay, I understand that they're dead physically, but spiritually, they're with Christ. They're righteous people. They're a part of the church. So that's, that's the short answer to that, okay? So anyway, lifting one's mind and heart to God, man is requesting those things that are um, for his true good. Okay, so um, another question I have is, you know, why doesn't God answer some of my prayers? Doesn't, you know, weren't you told as I was that you pray God will hear and he'll give you those things? Okay, well, I have a lot of things that I would like. I pray for them. I don't get them. Um, that was confusing to me as a young person. Uh, you could probably envision now that those of you that are fortunate enough to be parents when you get older, you, you're not going to give your children everything they want. You know that's not good for them. You know they're not always going to understand it, right? I remember, you know, me being young saying, you know, I want to go play with this, you know, go over to this guy's house. You're not going over there because, you know, you always get in trouble over there. You can't tell me who I, you know, who is not my friend. You know, slap. Yes, I can. That kind of thing. But they see farther down the road than us, right? So they know what is good for us. They're not infallible. But parents, you know, do have a bit more uh, wisdom that they've learned throughout the world. So how much more than with God? So if if you know, we think in terms of something being answered by we received what we asked for, 
Um, that's not always the case, uh, you know. And I think about that with like life decisions. My wife goes to pit, right, and. Her mother gets remarried while she's out there, which means the income level goes up, and all of a sudden she has no aid and she can't go back to Pitt. So she winds up going to a state school. You know, I go to um, Gettysburg, same thing, it's a money issue, and then I got injured to football, so I go back to a state school, and there I met the love of my life. I'm, I, you know, if you would ask me at the time, do you want to go back to the state school? No, I want to stay here. You know, if you'd ask my wife, do you want to stay at Pitt? I want to stay here. I mean, it's hard for us to see ahead. You know, um, so anyway, let's go on. <coughs> Two foundations of prayer: contrite heart and humility. And I'll explain what I mean by each of those pretty clearly. Contrite heart means that you're aware of your sinfulness. All right, so you know you need God. If you don't need Him, if you're not, you know. Um, cognizant of the fact that you've fallen short on so many different levels, that's not going to be a way that you're going to approach God in genuine prayer. So that's why we say one of the foundations is to have a contrite heart. Be aware of your own sinfulness. You know, have mercy on me, O oh God, for I'm a sinner. Don't, don't even say, we start out at Mass with the penitential rite, because we're just recognizing that. Humility. Humility is not, you know, self-deprecating, Okay. It, it, humility is an, a genuine reflection of who you are, all right? So let me, let me be really clear what I mean. I want you to know that. You know, humility is like a genuine reflection, a self-evaluation, you know, if you want to say. So let's say that you're, 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 you're pretty fast. You're on the track team. You're going to go to states. You know, you can nail the half mile in under two minutes. Somebody says to you, oh, my God, you're like a gazelle out there. Can't get over how fast you are. There's nothing humble about saying, no, I'm not really that fast. Everybody's going to look, yeah, yes, you are, okay? Um, if you happen to be a, a football player that can catch anything that gets within five inches of your fingertips, and somebody tells you, man, you have, like, hands like glue. Like, I never saw anybody make catches like that. Oh, no, I'm not that good. Or, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, I mean, everybody already knows this, right? If you're, if you're this so smart that it's like you can get decent grades without studying, and somebody says, you know, I, I wish I had your ability just to grasp things like that. Well, I'm not really that smart. I mean, that's not humility. Humility is a, it's a self-assessment. It's recognizing it, but it's also not pointing towards yourself. So if you are that track star, say thanks. You know, I, I really appreciate that. I really work hard at it, and I appreciate you saying that. That's a humble response. If you're the guy that can catch anything, again, Hey, thanks for taking notice. It's like, you know, I, I try so hard. I'm so glad that that helps contribute to the team. If you're the student saying, you know, we all got our own gifts. This is mine. I'm not good in everything, but thank you. I am good in this. That's humble. What isn't humble is, yeah, I'm faster than anybody. You know, smarter than you are, that's for sure. Yeah, well, you can't catch anything but it hits you in the chest. That's not humble. That's pride, right? So there's nothing wrong with recognizing your own talents. It's just that you have, where, the, where the humility comes in is you realize these are gifts given to you, not for you, but for others, right? So think of that throughout your lives. Some of you are going to be great money managers. That's not an opportunity for you to become filthy rich. Um, you know, you, that's supposed to be for other people. You know, this is the community we live in. Anyway, we'll leave that for now. Okay. St. Augustine. He says we're beggars before God. And I'll explain exactly what I mean by this. Could you add the of humility again? Yeah, humility is like an honest self-reflection. Okay? It's an honest self-reflection. So Augustine says we're beggars before God. He's really talking, and this is important. God's thirst is matching ours. I know that sounds poetic, but that's a better way to say it. God's thirst is matching ours. Ours. In other words, you know, we're hungry and thirsty for certain things. God's hungry and thirsty for us. It's almost like the meeting of those two things. Right? This is so you already should start understanding how prayer is wider than sitting on you know say, kneeling on your knees. All right. Um, so it's where God's thirst and hunger matches ours. English is not a very good theological language because depending on what we're talking about, we don't have good words, right? So if I tell you I love God, 
if I tell you I love my wife, if I say I love you guys, and if I say I love, you know, my daughter's pet chinchilla, you drink one too? You know that I can't be, I cannot be talking about them all. I cannot be talking about them all in the same way. That would be odd, right? So, like, in Greek, there's the different words. You know, um, I can talk about the love with my wife, you know, Eros. I can talk about the love with my family, Sturgis. I can talk about the love between you and me, Helia. And I can talk about the love between me and God, Agape, right? So we have different words. I only bring it up because Eros is one of those words. Eros is where we get the word erotic. So, you know, I'm going to keep stressing, especially next semester, to get away from just pure the sexual understanding of that, right? So eros is this attraction. It's almost what we're talking about here. It's like God's eros, and this comes from Benedict the Sixteenth. It's God's, you know, eros, his attraction towards us and our attraction towards him. It's like it's like a fulfillment of our of us within him. Okay? Again, he has no need, strictly speaking, but he's drawing us towards him. That's what we're talking about here. Okay. Um, I got a short clip. Uh, just to show you because, you know, I want to stress the humility and the contrition is necessary for a good prayer. So who saw Bruce Almighty? Yes. Uh, yes all right. <laughs> well, you know, um, we got Bruce and then we got Morgan Freeman as God, right? Makes a great God, right? And we have Jennifer Aniston as Grace, okay? So I have a scene here, not the very beginning of this, it's a very short scene, and just for those of you that have not seen it, and those of you that have, to refresh your memories, uh, Bruce has been given, Jim Carrey has been given, you know, all the abilities of God, but just for a small portion of, I think, Cincinnati. Um, and he's been abusing them, you know, making people taller, people winning the lottery. In other words, he's been quite selfish with it. But the one thing that he can't do is, is make Grace Jennifer Aniston love him. And he's been a jerk, so she's left. And he's struggling now um, what to do. And he's kind of hit bottom. So he's out on a rainy night. He's in the middle of the road. And he gets down on his knees and he sees a light. And he doesn't realize it's a tractor trailer. <laughs> the tractor trailer hits it and kills him. And then that's the scene you will see with him and Morgan Freeman in heaven. Okay? So I'm just kind of lining it up a little bit. Hold on. How many fingers am I holding up? Now, Bruce, thou shalt not tempt the Lord. And if you can't do it, then that's cool. Three, two, four, nine, six, eight, one. Okay. How many now? Seven. <laughs> this is the same. Now he'll become humble and contrite. If you remember the movie, God, a.k.a. Morgan Freeman, says, I'll get right on it. 
hitting him in the chest and goes, ouch, and he hits him harder, and the next thing, uh, <coughs> Bruce is on the ground getting, you know, brought back to life by the defibrillators, you know, so, anyway, anyway, ni nice little section there of the movie, okay? Okay, now, liturgy is the source of life. We're keep we're going to keep trying to build on our understanding of liturgy. We started off by saying it's, you know, it's the work of the people, but, you know, that's so basic, it's not going to tell us what we need to know. So liturgy, and I told you the liturgy is the highest prayer, that not all prayers are equal, okay? Um, but let's not think that liturgy, somehow, what we do on Sundays, exhausts all the activity of us as people of the church. In other words, liturgy has to be preceded by something. And I'm going to give you three things in particular that liturgy has to be preceded by. First off is evangelization. If you wonder why more people want, don't want to be Catholic, think of how Catholics present themselves. And I used the example before that if we were to start a club here at Burke's Catholic and I were to, somebody were to ask you, what's it about? Well, we don't always mean, it's, it's kind of boring. Some of the people are mean, but I really do think, you know, it's, it's okay to you join. And nobody's going to go for that, right? So, you know, how do we present ourselves? So, proclaiming the Christ by uh, word and witness, okay? Evangelization is proclaiming Christ by word and witness. Now, if you're like me when I was your age, the last thing I want to do is talk about my Catholic faith. And I, you might think, as I did, and I certainly don't feel comfortable sharing my Catholic faith. Fair enough. Then live it. You know? Then live it. Be so kind that everybody knows that. Be so genuine that everybody knows that. I mean, just pick all the virtues and live them. All right? I have another short video. It's a little humorous. It might be a little corny, but everybody gets a kick out of it. Yeah. Yeah, proclaiming Christ by both word and witness. This is called the Evangelization Linebacker. Here at the National Institute for Student Ministries, we've discovered a new method of evangelism that is shaking the very foundation of our thinking. It may appear unorthodox, but frankly, we're shocked at the results. We're amazed at this revolutionary idea, especially designed to boost student evangelism. Why do I want to be an evangelism linebacker? Well, let me put it to you like this. As a fish was created to swim in water, as a bird was created to fly, I was created to knock people out who don't evangelize. <laughs> the evangelism linebacker deals directly with a variety of students' fears associated with sharing their faith. All right, tell you, this house has got your name on it. I'm not ready yet. What makes you think I'm ready, though? There's rejection, for example. Let me talk to you about fear. Fourth and one, Jerry Rice, what you gonna do? They don't compare to fourth and one in eternity. It doesn't matter who rejects us because we're always accepted by Christ. God loves you. Get off the throne and don't go to God. Can you talk to for a minute? I'm a lover, not a fighter, baby. He loves you. You <laughs> might hurt. Sometimes I'll blow you up, but it's because I love you. Yeah, but just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I need to be out sharing my faith. I mean, God! Can he stick the glass? Deep clean through you in the trash! Thanks to the evangelism linebacker, campus evangelism nationwide is up 87%. I don't think you're going to help me do it again! Yeah, I can't go to the outreach today. I got, I just got some more important things I gotta do. <laughs> <laughs> Hey man, give me a break. I went to church on Sunday. I gotta go. The world needs your message, but God so loved the world. He wants to communicate it through you. If you procrastinate, you will open up the gate to a beast that will give that poor boy. When I see selfishness, it is my job to blow it. That's what I do. I blow them up so that they can get their eyes off themselves and look at Christ, the prize. What's up, baby girl? Nah, I'm busy. <laughs> We're intrigued. The linebacker is particularly effective in infiltrating centers of cultural and intellectual exchange. Here you go, ladies and gentlemen. Cappuccino, latte, welcome to the twist. Not too bad, not too cold. Perfect for you. 
So anyway, a humorous way to make the point that evangelization is an action, all right? Um, it could be the actions of yourself or speech. Okay, now faith. Faith is the personal set and adherence. You know, those are both important parts, right? The personal ascent and adherence to the whole truth is revealed by God. It's a personal assent and adherence to the whole truth as revealed by God. So, we have to be careful here. Um, you need more than just, if, if, if some people think faith is like, well, I'm, I believe in God. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if that's the extent of it, I try to be a good person and I believe in God. Well, okay, being a good person makes you a nice Boy Scout or Girl Scout, and believing in God, you can share that with, you know, both Satan and the demons. They, too, believe in him, all right? So, it's an ascent, and, like, you're agreeing with this stuff, and it's an adherence. You're sticking to it. So, yes, you must believe that God exists, and yes, you must do good things in his name, but, you know, let's be very clear that this is not just about being good, and it's not just about believing in God, Okay? It's, it's the entire thing. So it should invade and, you know, pervade every aspect of your life. I like the word invade. It really should. Um, all right? And the last thing, and remember, just keep in mind what we're talking about here. Liturgy is not the first opportunity for people to uh, recognize Christ and movement in their lives. So conversion is a radical reorientation of the whole self, okay? It's a radical reorientation of the whole self away from evil and towards God. The radical reorientation of the whole self away from evil and towards God. So you should have in your mind that to convert is literally to do a 180. Alright? So let's think about the woman at the well, right? Like, I thought if God loves me, he'll accept me as I am. Okay, that's where he'll receive you. But conversion is going to turn you around 180 degrees. So we have to be careful when we talk about churches, are they welcoming all peoples? Does that mean they're welcoming them in for conversion, or are they just accepting whatever behaviors they have? Those two things are not the equivalent. And although the latter seems kind, it's not the gospel, okay? So the reason why I put these up here is because we, we seem to be at a slight disadvantage. Um, you start opening yourself up to God, and I assure you, I'm not trying to be corny or, you know, say things in a way that just seem, you know, all these supernatural things are happening around us, although they are in a certain sense. If you make yourself available to God, you'd be amazed at the ways he would use you. I know that sounds like a lie, okay? So, and, and you don't have to be anything special. Me and my wife are nothing special. It's amazing, before I was teaching, when I was working full time in my studio, how many people would show up? They weren't like strangers, although sometimes they were. It was odd. They could be customers or they could be friends that just show up. Can I talk to you? And next thing I know, we're there for a couple hours talking about, and I, I don't want to be specific, but I don't want to give it out to them. Very, very deep things, um, very hurting things. And um, I had a friend who was a very devout Christian 
who work for us, and he, he always used to joke. He goes, it's like a counseling session at this place. It's amazing how people would show up for that. So one of my employees said about this one particular person, why don't you take them to church? I said, and what, what is that supposed to do? Now see, it seems like we're at a disadvantage because I know some evangelical church, you can bring the person and the first day they're in. What does it mean to join a church? It means that you say, I'd like to be here, or you, you know, sign a membership thing, and say, I'd like to join this church. What happens in the Catholic church? Well, you can certainly come to a mass, but if you'd like to join, Okay, you know, now it just happens to be we're in the fall, but you'll go through our CIA, and then Anissa will bring you in. You know, so it, there's a process. So it seems like we're at a disadvantage, right? Uh, but the problem is, is that if you don't have a grasp of, of liturgical um, worship and understanding, liturgy is not the first encounter. The person has first been evangelized by you or other people in their lives. They, there's something there. What is it that that person has? You know, then there's that ascent to a faith where they start to grasp and accept this faith that comes in Christ. And then there's the conversion. And only at that point now can be brought into the mysteries of the faith. Prior to that, it, it, it's a different understanding, all right? So it seems like it's unwelcoming. It seems like it's a disadvantage. But I don't have to, to explain to you, or maybe I would if I had time I could, the historicity of what I just told you. Nobody just walked into the early churches and became members. Just like you wouldn't do it if you were Jewish. If you had, you know, something you felt like, I want to be part of this particular synagogue, you don't just go in and sign something and now join. They want to bring you into their faith like we do. Yes? Um, not to to like a pop, even if you're back at that time, you know, it's not that No. Okay. Here's, here's the deal. Um, technically, no. If you are baptized with water in the Trinitarian formula, okay, by anybody, you're already a Christian, okay. So technically, no. Most parishes like you to go through the process anyway, but that's not what that process was set up for, okay. So depending on what particular parishes that is, you do need to receive the other sacraments, but that can be really done any time, okay. So um, that's something you work out with a particular priest. They could be brought in you know, November 2nd, January 18th, doesn't matter. Okay? But sometimes, I know my particular parish puts them in the RCIA. I have kind of issues with that, but I'm not in charge. Right? I mean, they're not outside of the faith. RCIA was developed for only those people who have never been baptized or were not baptized in the Trinitarian formula for whatever reason. Because there are some churches that just don't baptize it. You know, I baptize in the name of Jesus. Now, that may sound like it's just a little you know, technicality for you, but we're a Trinitarian people. All right? So just to reiterate, liturgy is not the first encounter, okay? All of this precedes it. So what happens then in the liturgy is there we're brought in, and this is the part you need to know, the dot, dot, dot. We're brought into the mysteries of the faith. Don't we say this at Mass, all right? You know, we talk about our own penitential right before we're brought into the mysteries of the faith. I don't have time to go over it today, and I don't know if we're going to get a chance to go over it, because there's only so much we can cover. But you know there's two parts to the liturgy, the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. Another name for the liturgy of the Word is the liturgy of the catechumens. The Orthodox, most of them still call it that. The catechumen is that person who's considering and entering the church. Everybody... No matter where you're from, no matter what your background is, you know, religiously speaking, you're welcome to the Liturgy of the Word. Technically, after the Liturgy of the Word, that person should exclude themselves. Either stand in the nave, I mean, the narthex, or leave. It's not that there's something hidden there. Like, we'll learn that mystery doesn't mean, hey, we don't want you to know this. We want it to remain a mystery. You're not spiritually formed yet. You're not part of the body. You don't share in the Eucharist with us. It, it, there's parts there that if it's read, it says, you know, we now, you know, um, excuse those catechumens. You'll see this sometimes during the Lenten period, right, as it gets close to Easter. And we look forward to the day that we can bring you into full communion and have supper with you, all right? But we live in such a pluralistic age, you know, it's one of the elements, right, that, well, that's rude. You're asking people to leave. You know, the whole, it's all how you approach a question. Right? It's all how you approach a question. 
Okay. But we'll talk about that another day. Okay, so the church is a servant. You don't need to write all this down. This is right out of the catechism. So our word liturgy will not only refer to divine worship, but it's the proclamation of the gospel and act of charity. So, you know, I actually wrote probably a 120-page thesis on this. Liturgy spreads out into our lives. Well, the mysteries, the, make sure you know that, that we have, you know, we're brought in the mysteries of the faith, all right? By the way, let me say it now, um, we use the word sacrament in the Latin Western church, you know, in the Eastern churches, they use the word mystery. So when we're talking about, mis when you hear the word mystery, start hearing the word sacrament now, all right? So when you're being brought in in the mysteries of faith, you start to be brought into something that's going to bring you into union with God. So anyway... It has a lot more to do than simply the liturgical rite we're talking about. So we're talking about service of God and neighbor, which is just an extension of glorifying God and sanctifying man, okay? Um, so the whole entire church, which is us, by the way, start hearing the word church as the body of Christ, the baptized. We are made in the image of her Lord. All right, so priest, prophet, and king. By baptism... You are a priest. You're not a ministerial priest like Father Ritz, but you are of the common priesthood. So what is it that you're supposed to be doing as a priest? Well, uniting your sacrifices with that of Christ. Okay? So a priest is a servant. You too are a servant. I am a servant. And I am too able to make sacrifices. Not the same sacrifice the ministerial priest is. There's the high priest, that's Christ, once and only. Then you have the ministerial priest, and then you have the common priest of all the baptized. Which really means that there's a universal, this is, came from Vatican II, there's a universal call from holiness. So don't think because you're not a priest that you should not be holy. As a matter of fact, you know, you know well, and I'm not talking disparagingly of priests, you know a lot of people, typically older women, who are probably holier than most priests. Father Ritz will probably be the first one to mention that. All right? So we can't let it up to them. It's not their job to evangelize. It's our job, right? So it probably comes more authentic from us because, you know, when priests talk about Jesus and the role of God in their life, everybody's thinking, well, this is what he does for a living. When we do it, they're knowing they're doing it because it comes right from the heart. Not that it doesn't come from their heart, but it's a different approach. We're also a prophet, which means that we have to proclaim the gospel. If you don't feel comfortable speaking about your faith, then fine. Then live it. But, you're gonna, but you can't get away, you know, this cheaply. Live in a way that's clear. And you know exactly what I mean. There are things that, I mean, you know within this school who has the political clout, right? Who can stick up for those that either are targets or don't. Use that clout. I mean, what are you afraid of? You're going to lose your cool reputation, right? You're going to have opportunities all through your life to spread the gospel. I mean, be a business owner that really works towards social justice. Maybe you're going to have an opportunity to be an insurance agent or work in a bank, and you're going to be able to do things to help those other people with things they need, and then car insurance to house loans, and don't get filthy rich or work against them. Don't give somebody something that if you're a, you could be that you're um, going to be, you know, a real estate agent. Maybe it's, it could be industrial things, commercial, or it could be just private residences. Don't mislead people. I mean, I mean, you will have a <coughs> reputation for being authentic and sincere in your life. Connect that to your faith, and you're you're spreading the gospel and evangelizing. All right, it's, it really is that simple. I mean, I don't mean it's that simple to do. It's that simple to understand. You know, so try in your lives not to use the excuse, well, I don't have a lot of control over it. This is how things are. Change things. Do things. And, I, and we, if, you, if you guys pick social justice next semester as one of the things, I can give you very clear examples in business where people have done extraordinary things. And I also will tell you, you know, about some of the things that you buy now, anything from insurance to eyeglasses, and if you knew the, the actual um, cost of it, 
you, you would probably, you know, light torches and like ring the village thinking, why am I charged so much for this, right? Like the EpiPen, you guys heard about all this going on the EpiPen. Do you know what the actual ingredient in the EpiPen, do you know what that costs? If they're selling it, let's just say they're selling it for $800. The actual cost is like right around a dollar. Yeah. I mean, uh, somebody's making money. Okay, but see, that that's just one example. I'm not picking on the pharmaceutical industry. It goes across the board, right? So, proclaim the gospel. Census fide, just to, real quick. Does anybody want to venture a guess what that means? It's Latin, but it's pretty easy to get. Grace. Grace, come on. The sense of who? What is fide? Faith. No. Faith. Sense of the faithful, okay? So, in other words, sometimes we have this, this natural religiosity to us, right? We get things. Um, it's this, I don't want to go any farther than this, but here's, I'm, I'm more interested in that you know what it is that it's not. When we talk about the sense of the faithful, this isn't a, like a popularity contest or uh, a majority vote. You've probably heard statistics, which are, might be true, that the majority of Catholics do not believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So what do we do with that? Do we change our doctrines now? No. Okay. So the sense of the faithful does not mean that we're taking a majority vote and that we're going to go with that. But nonetheless, as a people of God, because we're priest, prophet, and king, especially here in prophet, proclaiming the gospel, we have a sense of what our faith is. The last is king, right? So we're sharing in Christ's mission. When Christ left, we're it. You know, I mean, I often think, God, you should have done better than pick me to represent you. And maybe you'll think that too, Okay. But the reality is, is you and I will never see Christ. The day we see Christ, it's lights out, right? I mean, that's it. You see Christ, you pretty much, unless it's Morgan Freeman and you get another shot at it, right? You're done. So the only person that, the only way any person will see Christ is in you and me. And then that's what we're accountable for, okay? Any questions?